the Latter-day Saint dietary revelation known as the Word of Wisdom is a very well-established tenet of the faith. The revelation discusses things that we should refrain from, such as consuming alcohol, tobacco, and hot drinks, which prophets have interpreted as coffee and tea. But also in there, there is a part about counsel on eating meat sparingly, and specifically only in times of winter and famine. All grain is ordained for the use of man and of beasts to be the staff of life, not only for man, but for the beasts of the field and the fowls of heaven and all wild animals that run or creep on the earth. And these hath God made for the use of man only in times of famine and excess of hunger. We may be tempted to think that we understand what the Word of Wisdom is saying here, but perhaps it's worth a closer look. The Revelation makes a subtle distinction about wild animals that we may have missed. In today's episode, Dr. Andrew Hedges from BYU's Department of Church History and Doctrine is going to share some fascinating research, contextualizing the Word of Wisdom's teachings on this subtle but important use of the terms fowls of the air and beasts of the field in the revelatory text to help us understand some of this counsel regarding eating meat. And you know, all these revolutionary theological things that we bring up that Joseph revealed and that were new on the theological scene, this was a whole new approach to the relationship between man and animals, especially wild animals at the time. Totally new. The insights of this research are important and should be considered by every conscientious Latter-day Saint. I'm your host, Professor Anthony Sweat, and this is Why Religion. Each year, religion professors at Brigham Young University produce hundreds of publications on subjects related to The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This podcast brings this research into one place to enlighten the everyday seeker of truth. Seek learning, even by study and also by faith. Interviewing the author, we discuss why the study was done, why it matters, and why the professor chooses to be both a scholar and a disciple. This is Why Religion, research to enlighten your mind. Well, you're in for a treat today, my podcast friends. Uh, The article that's going to be discussed is called A Forbearance of Restraint. American Wildlife and the Word of Wisdom, 1560 to 1833, written by Dr. Andrew Hedges and published in the Fall 2018 Mormon Historical Studies Journal. Wherever you may personally fall on the idea of eating meat or animals or hunting wild game, I promise you that Dr. Hedges' insights will be very valuable to more fully develop your thinking. In part one, Dr. Hedges will talk about why he did this research, and in particular, the context of the Word of Wisdom's revelation in the 1830s, and what's happening in America with hunting wildlife. In part two, Professor Hedges will get a little bit more into the implications of this research, and how understanding the distinction about fowls of the air and beasts of the field may affect our practice as Latter-day Saints. And then in part three, like usual, Professor Hedges will share a little bit about his academic journey and why he chooses to be a believer. So here is Professor Brad Wilcox interviewing Professor Andrew Hedges. The thing I found so fascinating about your research is that it did something that hasn't been done before. I mean, a lot of people have written about the Word of Wisdom. A lot of people have studied it. And a lot of people have even related the Word of Wisdom to health practices in our day. But you placed the revelation in a historical context. You examined the social and cultural influences that may have been acting on Joseph Smith during the time when he was receiving this revelation. And that just fascinated me. Well, and, and whether they were acting on him or not, it's hard to say because it's the, it's the social and cultural influences and practices relating to uh, wildlife, how Americans, how, how people were viewing and treating and, and behaving in connection with uh, the wildlife that was around them. People have looked, and they've been great studies, looking at um, the context as far as you know, other movements about um, harmful substances, you know, the temperance movement, let's get off of alcohol, 
um, that was going on at the time Joseph Smith receives this revelation. What I try to do here is I, I, I provide a context on a topic that, as far as I know, nobody else has really looked at. What were people uh, doing with, with wild animals, with wildlife? How were they treating the animal life that was around them? And by doing so, I think it's just amazing that you've been able to show clear differences between uh, what Joseph was experiencing and the revelation he was receiving. And that he wasn't just borrowing wholesale, as you say in your article, from, you know, the temperance movement and other movements about health and, uh, and avoiding harmful substances. You're, you're showing differences that become very meaningful to us in our testimonies of Joseph Smith. Yeah, yeah. No, he was, I mean, like Joseph did, uh, always was, he was an iconoclast. And although, you know, perhaps influenced by things around him, he also produces brand new revolutionary material. Yeah, and to my knowledge, nobody has looked at environmental uh, contexts for the word of wisdom. And this is what you've done and done so beautifully. Tell us a little bit about uh, the wildlife in uh, the early American time periods. Tell us about the practices of people. Yeah. Well, and the thing, maybe even before I do that, what, what got me started on it, asking the question, was there in, it's, I guess, verses 12 through 15. And the real one, it really kind of zeroes in at the end of verse 14 and verse 15, where I was, you know, you just read, and we've all read these before, um, talks about how grain is, you know, for, the, for man and beasts, and it talks about and all wild animals that run or creep on the earth. Grain is kind of their... Uh, their mainstay. But then verse 15, and these, and it seems to be talking about wild animals, hath God made for the use of man only in times of famine and excess of hunger. So he gives a very, you know, distinct, uh, very definitive direction about how wild animals are to be used. And that so, revelation challenged the practices of the time. Well, and that's that's the point. So I was wondering, so, you know, that's interesting that the, that the Lord would mention uh, wild animals and say, here's specifically how they're supposed to be used. So I was wondering, how how were they being used? I mean, here's what the Lord says, here's how they should be used. I then started to wonder, well, how were they being used? What was going on? Yeah, so if this is a correction, what's he yeah. correcting? Yeah, what's he correcting, essentially? Yeah. Good way to put it. And so um, I went back all the way into the 1500s uh, just looking for early explorer accounts, um, early settler accounts, um, early naturalists, and just worked all the way up to 1833. It takes forever. I mean, it's it's a lot of reading about wild animals, but just what was going on. And, and what you find in a nutshell is, first of all, America was home to, I mean, just a prodigious number of wild animals. Early on, everybody's just astounded, all these people coming from Europe, astounded, amazed at the, the numbers and the varieties of yeah. animals all around. I, I love the one quote you gave that said, of birds diversely colored, there are infinite. Yeah, that's, that's one, of the, one of the early accounts we have from oh, Calverts. Right. Yeah, and there's just a whole bunch of accounts like that, and they, just, they talk about it. So they're, they're amazed, they're astounded at the numbers. Mm -hmm. um, and then you also see, though, how they're using them. And they're they're just they're just shooting everything and trapping everything. Um, they they use them year round, and yet uh, this this same idea that you know these things are here. Let's just exploit them to the max, and that's what they're doing. They're they're killing animals. Often they're just for sport. They're they're letting them rot on the ground. They're killing uh, so many geese that they're feeding them to their dogs. You know, as pet food. They're killing nestlings of various species just to use, uh, to boil them down and use them for oil and for, for grease and lubrication and things like that. And it's just, it's just a slaughter decade after decade after decade. So no restraint and no, uh, no rules about yeah. hunting or and over hunting. Any time a rule came up, I mean, they were poorly enforced and easily ignored and people pretty much doing things 
as much as they wanted. And it really was, you know, get it while the getting's good. Well, you mentioned in the article how they even justified this kind of excess using the Bible. You know, God's directive to Adam in the Bible to subdue the earth, to yeah. exercise dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Genesis one twenty eight. And a lot of early Americans took that to mean I can, you know, exploit this as much as I possibly can for my own gain. And the way you put it, there just there just wasn't a whole lot of restraint. And of course you could find individuals who would do that, but as, as a culture at large, it was just take as much as you can. And so it was really interesting. As early as the mid-1700s, people were starting to look around saying, where is everything? You know, we used to be able to come out here and there were you know, flocks of ducks and geese and grouse and deer and, and buffalo and elk and all these things. And you can't find them anymore. And, I mean, that, that's early, where, where in the eastern United States they were they were starting to to see, you know, this is having an impact. Yeah, I love in the article the way you point out that people made no difference between whether it was a male animal or a female animal, and that they even would take eggs and mothers and young. Yeah, at their most vulnerable stages. Indifferently, just with no thought of we need them to be able to continue to populate this this feeding ground. Yeah, and I think I think the reason for that was because the country is moving west. So if you used up everything in one area, well, we're moving west and and there's all this untouched ground and and all these, you know, animal populations that are still haven't been exploited. And so there wasn't this sense of saving up for the future and and keeping a baseline uh, population that can reproduce and and fill back up because we'll just we'll accomplish that by moving west was the idea and so they just they were just doing everything uh and animal populations were uh really suffering um some even starting to go extinct i was i was struck to learn that uh, a bird called the great auk um had this you know nested as a seabird nesting on islands and went extinct. The last pair was killed June of 1844. Wow. Precisely the same month uh, that Joseph Smith and Hiram were killed. And that was the culmination of a couple centuries of just unrestrained, unlicensed slaughter for that particular species and so many other species heading in the same direction. You know, in the article, you also point out that the Native Americans had previously hunted for food or for skins, uh, but now they were hunting for trade. They got caught up in it as well, and and you could, uh, you know, you'd get paid for the deer hides that you produced or something like that. And you also had weapons much more effective than a bow and an arrow. And so Native Americans uh, bought into this just like everybody else did. So what was going on specifically at the time of Joseph Smith? Well, so by the time you get to Joseph Smith and and the Word of Wisdom, 1833, this had been going on pretty solid for about 200 years. I mean, it was entrenched in the, the culture of early America. It's there, take as much as we can. And after 200 years of that, uh, there were a lot of species at least in some parts of the country, that were in serious decline. Yeah. You mentioned shooting clubs that would, you know, with kill reports, uh, shooting parties, pigeon matches, and that these appeared as a regular feature of a sporting, you know, yeah. a sporting nature. Yeah, you really did. By the time of Joseph Smith, you have, you have sport shooting kind of emerging as a new way of doing this. And it was all about numbers. Um, whether you know whether you needed them for food or were going to use them in some other way, the important thing was how many, how many did you get in this particular day or this particular block of time? You know, you mentioned in the article that Joseph Smith may or may not have been aware of right. this, but considering the fact that he had traveled from the east to the west, the, considering the fact that he was in the frontier. Uh, then maybe he did 
you know, maybe he was more sensitive to this. Yeah, I, I mean, there's no evidence that he was reading John James Audubon uh, or, you know, some of these other people who were drawing attention to all of this that was going on. But I'm, I'm with you. I, I think it's hard to imagine that he wasn't aware, given his life had kind of moved west with everybody else. And then he's, he's just talking with everybody. People are coming and visiting Joseph, and he loves to talk, and uh, he loves to listen, and he loves to learn. And I suspect he was personally somewhat aware of the decline in a lot of animal populations. So then when the revelation came, and most of us only focus on hot drinks or tobacco right. or alcohol, but suddenly the revelation also includes this focus on wild animals and how they are for the use of man only in times of famine and excess of hunger. That was contrary to the thinking at the time. It was, it was as contrary to the thinking of, of the time as Joseph's ideas on, on the atonement and on the fall and you know, all these revolutionary theological things that we bring up that, that uh, Joseph revealed and that were new on the theological scene, this was a whole new approach to the relationship between man and animals, especially wild animals at the time. A very unique perspective. Totally new. Nobody, I mean, there were, there were people saying, hey, we need to pull back because we're losing animals and things like that. But something as strict as, as what you just read, only in times of famine or excess hunger. Nobody was talking that. How does that jive with other revelations that Joseph received? Is it consistent or was this very uh, a standalone? No, it seems to kind of be the, the culmination of, of a similar vein. Uh, you see this, a, a sensitivity, uh, a call for awareness and sensitivity in how we use animal life and how we you know, eat meat. Certainly not told not to do it not proscribed. In fact, a little earlier revelation, section 49, uh, the Lord says, you know, anybody who says you're supposed to abstain from me, they're, they're not of God. You're supposed to, these, these things have been made for the use of man. But it's supposed to be done, uh, you know, with thanksgiving and carefully and appropriately. And so he seems, what, what you'll find in Joseph's revelation, you'll find revelations, you'll find the Lord saying, these things are to be used. And if, if you're not using them and, and you're telling people not to use them, that's not correct. But don't overuse them. There's this, there's this fine line, this balance. And you have some groups like the Shakers who took the position, you're not supposed to use meat at all. And the Lord said, that's not the correct position. What you seem to have, what I tried to show in this article, is that most Americans were actually way over on the other side, killing animals for just about any reason they wanted. And the Lord is saying, that's not right either. You don't kill them for sport. You don't kill them for fun. You don't kill them for grease. You don't kill them for all these, these other crazy things that they are being used for. You don't, you don't kill them just because they're a pest. You don't like their sound at 5 a.m. Uh, in the morning or something like that. You kill them and you use them only in times of famine and excess of hunger. So when Joseph is, is uh, teaching this, how was he acting? I mean, were his actions consistent with the revelations? Pretty much. I mean, you know, you'll find, I mentioned in the article, uh, I can't remember the month or the year, but he talks about having a great dinner of wild turkey. <laughs> you know, he just loved it. I don't know if it was excess of hunger or famine, Maybe it was just a holiday. Maybe it was a holiday. Maybe, I mean, that can be relative. I remember having a student. He was a football player, a huge guy. And we were talking word of wisdom and we're talking about this verse. And he said, look, man, um, I experience famine every day of my life. <laughs> you know? And so leave it open for, for personal interpretation there. But what, whatever... Does he draw a line between domesticated animals and wild animals? Not, not so much that I can see, but you do, you do see. Uh, this probably comes out most clearly in Joseph's own behavior the year after this revelation was received, 1834. 
And if you remember church history, that's when Joseph and several others are marching from Kirtland. Zion's camp. Zion's camp. And they are in some tough conditions there. And Joseph took the opportunity to, to model, I think, to teach by example a couple of times the principles that were in the Word of Wisdom on this. One of them, very, very famous uh, account where um, they run into, the Zion's camp runs into a bunch of rattlesnakes at one of their camping grounds. And all these men, uh, you know, when somebody yells snake, everybody comes running forward ready to kill it, like, like we do today, generally. And Joseph comes up and says, don't, don't kill those snakes. Um, you know, we shouldn't be killing anything unless we need it for food. And he says, I don't want to see anybody killing anything, even rattlesnakes. Uh, you know, I mean, if, if there's any way you could justify killing something, a rattlesnake's easy to yeah, do. That would be top on the list. Right. <laughs> but he says, no, That nothing. and spiders. And spiders are right up there and all of that. He says, no, we don't kill anything unless we need it for food, even rattlesnakes. And, and he, he drills that home and we're told um, that he's, he spent a fair amount of time, not just on that occasion, but on other occasions talking about it. And then apparently he puts them to a test. Joseph, in, in another part a little later on in Zion's camp, he shoots a squirrel out of a tree and the squirrel drops to the ground and Joseph walks away. Now in my article, I point out that squirrels, especially gray squirrels, were considered pests by most early Americans. A lot of colonies and states even put bounties on them. And people went out and killed so many squirrels and just, you know, shot them. Uh, and then you cut off the tail or something like that and you bring it in and you get paid for how many you brought in. But essentially wasting the animal. I mean, the, the, the flesh, the meat, just uh, wasted on the ground. That's what had been going on. So Joseph shoots this squirrel out of the tree and walks away after having taught, if we kill anything, we need to use it for food. And Orson Hyde saw this happen and put two and two together. And to Joseph's gratification, Orson Hyde went, took the squirrel, skinned it, and they ate it. They used it. And, and so you see, you see Joseph, I think, trying to inculcate this mentality If you're interested in more peer-reviewed, high-quality gospel scholarship about Latter-day Saint history, doctrine, or practice, such as this publication being discussed, BYU's Religious Studies Center is a great place to check out. Normally, I bring your attention to a new book that the RSC has published, but today I want to highlight all the research that is available for free on their website. The Religious Studies Center was formed under the direction of the then Dean of BYU Religion, you may have heard of him, Jeffrey R. Holland. From their own website, quote, it is a vital research and publication arm of religious education. It exists to seek out, encourage, and publish faithful gospel scholarship through sponsoring symposia and seminars, awarding research grants, and producing and disseminating high quality peer reviewed works, end of quote. Many of these past peer reviewed works are available for free through their search bar on their website. You can read peer-reviewed articles from the Religious Educator Journal, past Sperry Symposium or Church History Symposium proceedings, and Easter Conference talks. You can also get links to some Come Follow Me resources and some great new BYU Roundtable videos to support your own personal scripture study. Go check out their website and the resources available at rsc.byu.edu. Okay, we've come to part two of our religion where we like to explore some of the implications of this research and how this publication applies and affects the lives of everyday Latter-day Saints. So here again is Dr. Brad Wilcox interviewing Dr. Andrew Hedges on his research called A Forbearance of Restraint and how this implication from the Word of Wisdom might apply into our everyday lives. Tell me, what does this study say to Latter-day Saints today, what does it mean to us? That is a good question. It's a sensitive question um, because you, you start... You bet somebody listening is going to be saying, <laughs> yeah, Andy, how are you going to answer this question? Yeah, and I'm wondering myself here. Because you, you do get into, I mean, you get into guns, you get into hunting, and those are, uh, there's some very strong personal feelings and political feelings that people have about those. 
Um, so I realize it's, it's a little touchy here. Um, maybe some thoughts here. That's one of the things the Word of Wisdom does. The Word of Wisdom challenges long-held assumptions and practices and norms. And it asks us to do a little bit better. I would hope Latter-day Saints today would consider this part of the Word of Wisdom as in, in that light, as just like they would consider you know, looking at leaving alcohol and drugs and things like that. Um, I'm struck too. Uh, the neatest thing about the Word of Wisdom to me is the promise at the end. There's Which pro- isn't just a physical No, promise. I mean, it's certainly there. Promises of health and strength and all of that. But the really cool stuff to me, I mean, I, I, I do like good health, so this not that this is even better, but... In addition, there's, it talks about promises of wisdom and great treasures of knowledge, uh, even hidden treasures, that will be given to those who are willing to make these sacrifices and live these standards. And I, I would hope that Latter-day Saints today would consider that, you know, maybe there's, maybe there's some knowledge, there's some wisdom, there's some understanding that will come through a a more reverent approach uh, to the, the, the creatures that we share this earth with. I was speaking with a teenager who said, it doesn't matter if I'm vaping because the word of wisdom doesn't say anything Specifically. <laughs> and I thought, he needs wisdom. <laughs> and he needs knowledge. He needs to realize that the word of wisdom isn't a strict list of do's and don'ts but rather uh, a mirror through which we can see where we are and where we need to be yeah. spiritually as well as physically. And, and where we can be. Yes. And it, it may, it, it does require, I mean, you talk, you talk to someone, you know, who's the missionaries have tracked it out, uh, who's a smoker and a drinker and drinks coffee. And, you know, we ask a lot of them, to join the church. They've got to give up a lot. And we say, there's, there's blessings though. I mean, I know, I know these things are important to you. If you can do without them, there's these tremendous blessings that come. And maybe we need to be asking, at least, at least for myself, um, our, our, my, my treatment, my, my attitude towards my fellow creatures on this planet, um, seems to be something that there's some wisdom and knowledge pinned to that as well. And it may take some changes. I mean, I, I grew up hunting, I'll totally admit it, and, and had a good time. There were a lot of neat things with it. There's a lot of neat things, though, when you, when you put the gun down. Uh, there's a lot of neat things to learn. If you pick up the binoculars, if you pick up uh, a good camera, and if you just even just go to observe and watch and kind of experience what other creatures are experiencing, um, there are some neat things to learn that uh, might make us better people. I think that's a wonderful perspective. Now, how does this study impact our testimonies? Because along with our practices, I found this to be a very uplifting, building, testimony-confirming study because of the very fact that I could see God's fingerprints in this. It wasn't just Joseph spouting off whatever was popular. I can see God's fingerprints. And and to me, that strengthened me and my testimony. Perhaps that's part of the wisdom and knowledge that is promised in the word of wisdom as well. Yeah, I I think it it probably is. Um, You also see... You know, had I mean, this is one of those cases where I think you can see the Lord. The Lord gives a, a commandment or a word of wisdom, and you see people not keep it. And and what is the result? Well, the result is, um, you know, within a hundred years of this, uh, we have several species in the United States that go extinct that were you know numbered in the millions. Uh, the passenger pigeon is the famous one. 1914. That shows we're not being very good stewards. That's if if we're supposed to, you know, take good care of this earth and everything that's on it, 
we blew it there, we lose the Carolina parakeet uh, to extinction. I already mentioned uh, the great auk, and, and there are others. And you look, at, you look at where we are today, if you're following the news, um, the rate of extinction is, you know, just soaring and, and, you know, biodiversity is really threatened, not just by hunting, of course, but by uh, climate change, you know, all these other things that are also very political and sensitive. But I just, I can't help but wonder, you know, had we instituted back in 1833 a more careful, respectful, reverent approach to the wildlife around us, uh, we would probably still have passenger pigeons. We would have uh, Carolina parakeets. We would have these other things that we've lost and that there's no way of getting back. They're never coming back. And so it's a, it's a classic example where you can, you can see the, the, the Lord's wisdom, his finger, as you say, in what happened when people did not follow this counsel. If you're interested in reading all of Professor Hedge's really insightful publication, A Forbearance of Restraint, American Wildlife and the Word of Wisdom, 1560 to 1833, go to whyreligion.byu.edu where you can find a link to this publication. There you can also get access to past episodes of Why Religion and the publications discussed in each of those episodes. And remember, if you want to connect with us on Why Religion, see some behind the scenes photos and get bonus material, follow us on Instagram at Why Religion Podcast. That's at Why Religion Podcast. Okay, we've come to our final part of Why Religion, part three, where we like to talk a little bit with the professor about why the professor chooses to be a religious educator and why they choose faith. So here's Professor Wilcox wrapping up this great interview with Professor Andrew Hedges. Andy, would you please explain to us a little bit about your journey? How did you get to BYU? How did you become interested in historical research? I got to BYU through a series of little miracles, <laughs> like, like most of us do when we get here. I was starting out as a zoologist. I majored in zoology, minored in chemistry. I started a... Were you thinking pre-med? No, I've never thought pre-med. I always wanted to be a professor but I was going to be a professor of biology. And I even started uh, and got, got well into a master's degree in biology up at Utah State. And then um, while I was doing that on my downtime, I, I made the mistake of starting to read some history and really got into the history. American history, church history? Uh, most of it was actually ancient history oh. and then some American history. And I ended up, I was spending more and more time doing that and less and less time on my biology. Uh, still liked the biology, but just didn't quite speak to me going forward uh, like the history did. And so I dropped out of that program, came to BYU, got a master's in uh, Near East Studies, ancient Near East Studies, and then did another little switch to American history, went to the University of Illinois and got my uh, PhD in American history, early American history there. Well, I think it's interesting that you can see now those roots in the sciences and in biology and life sciences now coming into your research in this article. Yeah, that, that plant never died. Um, <laughs> it, it simply, I, I switched, you know, switched to another plant, but the plant still flourishes. I still read a lot of biology. I try to stay current in the sciences. And this was, this was a fun project because I really was able to bring my love of history and my love of uh, the sciences and, and animals and wildlife and things like that. They really came together. In a beautiful way. Well, Andy, as we finish up, would you please tell us how you maintain your testimony? How do you stay strong in your faith I read, I mean, my touchstone, my, my real touchstone is the Book of Mormon uh, and Joseph Smith's Revelation, the Bible. I, I love all of these. And I read them, and the, the, they ring true. And, and that's probably a colloquial way of saying that the Spirit tells me that these things are true. But they just, they ring true. And you step back and you look at the big picture and, and get perspective, and you can see... Um, the, 
the, the Lord is the Lord is behind this. I remember a conference talk President Hinckley gave where he was bearing his testimony at the end and he just he finally said at one point he said, Of course it's true. And I resonate with that. Well, of course it is. Um, it's the truest thing that's out there. And I, I realize there's people find challenges, they find difficulties, they find what would appear to be inconsistencies and things like that. I, I, I get that. Um, I see them. I'm aware of them. I've studied them a lot. Um, what matters, I think, more important than anything is, is your relationship with Heavenly Father and the, the feelings that you have in those quiet moments, which are hopefully fairly frequent, where it's, it's you and His words and His Spirit and the, the barriers and the 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 difficulties evaporate when uh, when those experiences take place. At least that's how it's been for me. Some people say that they feel close to God in nature when they're out in the mountains or when they're on the ocean. They feel close to God. You've done a whole study about nature. Is this something that's true for you? Very much so. Um, what are some of the times that you've felt that? All the time. Um, you know, I, I was out on my run this morning at 5 a.m. <laughs> and For those of you who are listening, I was not on a run this morning <laughs> at 5 a.m. That's the difference between Andy and me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, the stars were out. Uh, I, live in a, I live in a place where there's not a lot of artificial light. Yeah, you're kind of up in the mountains, aren't you? Yeah, and the stars were out and the Milky Way was out. And, I mean, after, after all the panting and, and whatnot, I was just, just there. Um, literally with eternity as my covering, to quote Abraham. And uh, it, it's times like that where I, I think you really can. I don't, I don't think it's an excuse for skipping church to go camping. <laughs> um, you got to, again, keep this balance. But when you are surrounded by God's handiwork, um, I think that's a testimony to God. And there's, there's a lot to learn about the Creator through his creations. You, you can learn a lot about somebody when you look at something they've made. You can see uh, what they care about. You can see how careful they are. And that, for me, is, is the connection between nature and God. You're looking at what he made. You're looking at the, the fruits of his mind and uh, his, his creativity. And it, it teaches you a lot, I think, about who he is. Thank you for listening to Why Religion. This podcast is a production of religious education at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. My name is Anthony Sweat. I'm the executive producer. The Why Religion podcast team also includes from Brigham Young University, professors Brad Wilcox, Casey Griffiths, and Ryan Sharp. Recording and mixing were done by BYU students Mitchell Bashford and Connor Miller. Say hi, Mitchell and Connor. Hi, guys. Hi. Original music and scoring for Why Religion podcast was created by the fabulous BYU student musicians Grant Cagle, Sam Clausen, Colette Jones, and Alistair Scheuermann. If you enjoy what you've heard, please like and subscribe to Why Religion on wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a rating. It really helps. And join us next time as we continue to bring the everyday Latter-day Saint fascinating gospel studies done by Brigham Young University religion professors to enlighten your mind and strengthen your faith.